Now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Western Adventure from Dodge City, Kansas, an episode of Gunsmoke starring William Conrad, December 26th, 1953, The Guitar. Now, Post Toasty, the Heat Good Cornflakes, is proud to present Gunsmoke. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, the story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Say there, next time you hear a crackling noise in your kitchen, better get up and investigate. Maybe somebody just couldn't wait for his breakfast of crackling crisp post-toasties. And that's a treat you shouldn't miss. Post-toasties, you know, are the heap good cornflakes. Why, after one taste... I'll bet anything you'll agree with me. Post Toasties is just the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. There's nothing quite like sweet kernel corn flavor when it's toasted right in. Toasted into crisp, fresh corn flakes. Man, oh man, that's Post Toasties. Heat good corn flakes. Better try them. And now, Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. <laughs> You sure are slow with that beer, Doc. I'm ready for another. You had enough last night, Chester. Matt told me you were still asleep at 9 o'clock this morning. Oh, I was. And it was mighty kind of him not to wake me up. Say, are you sure he said he'd be back this afternoon? That's what he told me. So I... Oh, oh, oh. oh. Now, what in the world is that fella? Who? I just came in the door there with, with Tyler and Short. Oh, him, that weed pendle. He rode in on a mule a couple days ago. Uh, well, which has the bigger ears, him or the mule? <laughs> Oh, he is funny looking, all right. And he acts peculiar, too. That's a mighty scrawny mule, Pendle. I seen you on him this morning. Pendle here is kind of scrawny yourself, Short. Maybe some beer to fatten him up a little. I'd like some beer, all right. But I got no money. Why'd you sell that guitar of yours? Sell my guitar? No, I'd never do that. You must have a nickel, at least. Last money I had got stole. Now, who dare steal money off a tiger like you, Pendle? I was asleep. I started to wake up, but they kicked me in the head. You call that a head? Looks to me more like your neck just growed out and haired over. <laughs> I ain't very handsome. You sure ain't. Hey, what'd your old lady think of you when she saw you, Pendle? I don't know. She died. Yeah, laughing, I'll bet. Oh, uh, <laughs> now, that's enough, Tully. That's too mean. Pendle's a harmless little fella. Ain't nobody talking to you, Chester. Well... Bartender... Three beers. You buying, Tyler? I'm proud, too. A fine old soldier like Weed Pendle. How'd you know I was a soldier? I didn't. Where was you a soldier, Pendle? Third Illinois Cavalry. Illinois? You was with the Yankees. Well, I never done much. We had hard luck and never got to see no real Confederates at all. Just a bunch of ragged-tailed bushwhackers in South Missouri... They was led by old chicken thief named Klein. Yeah, so they was. Tell me something, Pendle. 
Did you ever kill any of uh, Klein's men? A few. Huh? Before I got shot myself. They caught some of them after and hung them. But I never did see a hanging. You never saw a hang? Nowhere. I never did. That's so. Well, Pindle, you're in luck. Since we was kind of in the war together, so to speak, I'm going to show you a hanging. Uh, you're about ready, ain't you, Short? My rope's on my saddle. I'll get it and meet you out back. There going to be a hanging? Real hanging? It sure is. You're lucky, Pendle. You run into us just in time. What are you talking about, Tyler? Who are you going to hang? It's a kind of surprise, Chester. You can watch, too. Uh, here, you know it's against the law to hang people around here. I saw Marshal Dillon ride out town this morning. When he gets back, it'll be all over. And don't you try to buck me in short, Chester. You'll die if you do. Come on, Pendle. You don't want to miss it. Sure. What do you suppose they're up to, Doc? And I don't know, Chester, but I'd like to find out. Yeah, I guess we'd better. I sure do yeah. wish Mr. Dillon was here. I never did think much of Tyler and Short. They play no good. I'm worried, Doc. Yeah, there they are. Why, it's Pindle. They got a rope around his neck. Uh, of course, you won't see all the hanging, Pindle, just the start of it. What are you hanging me for? I ain't done nothing. You was in the 3rd Illinois Cavalry. Well, sure. We was fighting under that old chicken thief, Klein, in South Missouri. It's a real pleasure to hang a Yankee like you. But I only done what they told me to. I didn't kill nobody on purpose. All right, now, wait a minute, you two. You've gone far enough. Shoot him, Tyler. You go shooting anybody, and you'll be the ones to end up on a rope. Doc ain't armed. He never is. Go on, Tyler. All right. You can try it. But you're sure going to have to kill me before you hang anybody. I'll kill you. You'll have to kill me too, Tyler. Mr. Dillon. Ah, oh, where'd he come from? Take your rope off that man's neck, Short, and do it quick. Sure, Marshal. Sure. I told you you shouldn't hang me. Oh, we was just funning the Marshal. We wasn't going to hang him. What's this all about, Short? Well, he's a Yankee, Marshal. Killed a lot of us in Missouri during the war. We was going to scare him and then run him off. Well, you forget about that. And forget about the war, too. It's over. The next time I catch you up to anything like this, you're going to go to jail. Go to jail? Over a dumb Yankee who don't own nothing but a skinny mule and a guitar? Get out of here, Short. Hey, you too, Tyler. Okay, Marshal. But this Yankee better get out of here, too. Out of Dodge. Shut up, Tyler. And get moving. Sure. See you later, Pendle. <laughs> Marshal Dillon's here. He wants to see you. I sure do thank you for letting me sleep in your jail last night, Marshal. Where you been sleeping before, Pendle? With my mule. I always do. Huh? I, uh, hear you broke. What do you do for a living? I never did nothing much, Marshal. Just ride around on my mule. Well, what about your guitar? Don't you ever play and take up a collection or something? Oh, no, Marshal. I wouldn't do that. Well, why not? Can't, can't you play well enough? I don't know, Marshal. I never played it for nobody to hear, except me. Ah. All right. Uh, Chester, take him over to the Texas Trail, huh? Maybe Sam can give him a job of some kind. Well, it wouldn't be steady, would it? <laughs> well, I don't know, but uh, why shouldn't it be? Because I'll be leaving in a day or two. Oh? Where are you headed? Nowhere. Nowhere. Just ride around on my mule. I always do. And where are you from, anyway? I was born San Benito. Oh, on the Rio Grande? Yes. I left soon after. Took my guitar with me, though. Never did go back. Well, if you're from Texas, how come you fought in the Union Army? I don't know. One army's just like another, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe you're right at that. Uh, Chester, take him over to Sam's. Huh? All right, sir. I left my guitar back. I'll go get it. He sure is a peculiar little fellow, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, pretty helpless, too. You think Short and Tyler will bother him anymore? Well, knowing them, I believe they'd have hung him yesterday if they could have. Uh, you tell Sam to let me know if they even start talking to him again, huh? Yes, sir, I will. They're about the meanest pair of men I ever knew. Yeah, they are. And they'll think of something. Well... Pennell said he's leaving in a day or two. I hope that's soon enough, Chester. <laughs> the 
December 26th, 1953, Gunsmoke on Classic Radio Theater. Thanks for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater on your favorite station, December 26th, 1953, William Conrad as Marshal Matt Dillon in Gunsmoke. <laughs> Sam gave Weed Pendle a job sweeping up the saloon and let him live in a tiny shack out back. He tried to get him to play his guitar, but Pendle wouldn't do it. And we all began to think that he probably didn't even know how. It's hard to believe that anyone as simple as he was could learn to do anything. I looked up Short and Tyler and warned him again to leave him alone. And they did. Until one morning a couple of days later... Chester and I had just come out of Delmonico's and we're walking up Front Street. Look at there, Mr. Dillon, across the plaza. Yeah, I saw them. Let's go over there, Chester. It's Pendle and his mule, all right. Yeah. And Tyler and Short, too. I told them to keep away from him. What are they laughing at? Now, they're laughing, but he isn't. What do you suppose they've done to him now? Look at his mule, Chester. Well, That's what they've done. Oh, my goodness, Mr. Dillon. He's lost the ear. I thought Yankees liked their mules that way, Short. At least I always heard they did. I guess there's just no pleasing some men, Tyler. <laughs> you shouldn't have done that to my mule. Well, it's the marshal again. Did you men do this? Now, Marshal, we ain't done nothing to Pendle. Did they do it, Pendle? I tried to stop him, but Tyler held me. And they gave me my mule's ear, Marshal. Right here. See? Yeah. Turn around, both of you. Turn around, I said. Now take their guns, Chester. Yes, sir. Can't do nothing to us, Marshal. We didn't hurt Sandal. I don't like what you did to his mule. I got him, Mr. Dillon. Now, Rich, you can turn around again. I ought to cut an ear off of each of you. But I can't do that. So I'm going to do the next best thing. Now, look here, Marshal. You... Now, leave him there, Chester. Pendel, I'm sorry about your mule. He ain't much of a mule anymore. Well, you better go take care of him. And maybe these two will leave you alone now. Poor mule. told me yesterday, Matt. Well, it could have been almost anything knowing him, Kitty. No, this kind of makes sense. I asked him if he was ever lonely, and he said, no, he never stayed anywhere long enough to get to know anybody that well. Uh, he's a little strange, all right. Mm. Now what are they up to? Who? Tyler and Short. They just came in with Pendle. Oh? Look, Matt, he's got his guitar with him. Yeah. Hey, listen, everybody. Hey, listen, everybody. Little Yankee is going to play his guitar for us. At least he's going to try, ain't you, Yankee? <laughs> Don't shoot my mule. We ain't going to shoot your mule. Not if you play good enough. Go on, get started, if you know how. They threaten to kill his mule, Matt. you got to stop him. No, wait a minute, Kitty. <laughs> Go on, Pendle. Go on, play. Yeah, let's hear you. All right.
of surprised everybody, didn't he? <laughs> Tyler and Short don't look so happy about it. No. The crowd's with Pendle now. Good. They'll leave him. Yeah, they better. <laughs> Hello. You've been playing that guitar a long time in there, ain't you, Pindle? They wanted me to. They liked it. Well, me and Short been waiting to tell you how we liked it, too. Yeah. Let me see that guitar, Pindle. No. You hurt my mule. Give it to me. <laughs> I got a gun in your belly, Pindle. Don't move. I want my guitar. You can have it. I just want to sort of tune it for you first. Please, Dad. Please don't do that. Another thing that's wrong with this guitar, it's a little bit too big for a man like you. But I can make it smaller. There you are, Yankee soldier. Maybe this will learn them. Let's go short. <laughs> Are they both dead, Doc? Oh, my, yes. Real dead. For several hours, at least. Right. They must have been asleep when it happened, Doc. It looks like Short there struggled a little. I guess Tyler got his first, but it woke Short up for a minute. He wasn't awake very long, man. Yeah, just long enough to see who was cutting his throat, probably. Hmm. But he can't talk now. No. Nope. Yeah, I guess I'm all through here. What do you want to do with him? Yeah, we'll let the hotel worry about him. I guess it's Weed Pendle I want now. My, and him such a mild little fellow. Uh, any man can take just so much, Chester. I sure hate to see poor Pendle hang for killing these two buzzards, man. Chester, wait for me at the jail, huh? I'll bring him over as soon as I can find him. Sam? Yeah, what'll it be, Marshal? Where's Weed Pendle, Sam? Oh, I just sent him out back for a bucket of sawdust. What do you want him for? Short and Tyler got their throats cut early this morning. Good. I guess their smashing his guitar was too much for Pendle. That's so. Oh, oh there he is now. Pendle, come over here. Morning, Marshal. Good morning. Pendle. Where was you last night? I don't know. Here, I guess. You don't know. Now, wait a minute, Marshal. Pendle, where was you after they wrecked your guitar? Well, I sat in the alley a while, then I come back here. Yeah, that's right. And he was so broke up about his guitar, I didn't want to leave him alone, so I took him up and let him sleep on the floor of my room. Isn't that right, Pendle? Well, go on. Tell him now. Sure, Sam. That's right. Are you trying to alibi for him, Sam? Why, no, Marshal Dillon. <laughs> but I care about him. Some people care about me. Who, Pendle? He's just talking, Marshal. Who cares about you, Pendle? Tell me. Those men. What men? He means some of the boys that was here when he come back with his busted guitar, Marshal. They just told him how sorry he was, that's all. I see. They liked his music, didn't they? Yes, they did. They like to hear me play. Who was in here then, Sam? Well, now, Marshal Dillon, you know how it is. I'm busy pouring drinks, and I don't pay no mind to who's here and who ain't. I, I couldn't rightly say it all. Okay, Sam, I guess I can't beat the truth out of you. Oh, now, Marshal Dillon, who cares about Tyler and Short? Dodges is better off without There's him. a law against murder, Sam, and it's the same for everybody. December 26, 1953, Gunsmoke on Classic Radio Theater. 
Here's a great thing to consider doing right now before the end of the year. Call MediShare and find out just how much you would save by switching to MediShare, the affordable alternative to health insurance. When you call, you'll get some good news and probably be very happily surprised, too. The typical family saves $500 a month, but you might save even more. It's so worth it to at least find out. And you'll see why more than 400,000 people are already members. MediShare is a Christian community that shared more than $4 billion in each other's health care costs. It really is remarkable, and they're very easy to talk to. And here's the thing. If you join before the end of the year, they'll waive your new member fee. That's another $170 you'll save. I'll give you the number here in a second. The call, and you'll get a price within two minutes. And again, the deadline is December 31st, so call now. You'll save even more. Call 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. Now on Classic Radio Theater, the conclusion of Gunsmoke, the guitar, as it was originally broadcast December 26, 1953, William Conrad as Marshal Matt Dillon. Okay, Sam, I guess I can't beat the truth out of you. Oh, now, Marshal Dillon, who cares about Tyler and Short? Dodge is better off without him. There's a law against murder, Sam, and it's the same for everybody. And I'll be back later. <laughs> What are you going to do now, Mr. Dillon? Well, I've done all I can, Chester. The whole town's just plain quit talking. Nobody knows anything. Well, I guess they're all trying to protect Pendle. Yeah, they are. But he didn't do it. Well, who did then? Well, if I could prove who did it, Chester, I'd have him in jail. Say, come over here. Well, I declare, Mr. Dillon, it looks to me like he's leaving town. Yeah, I told him he could go. He looks funnier than ever on that one-eared mule. Yeah. Well, Dodge treated Pendle pretty rough. He sure did. Poor little fellow looks kind of empty like that his guitar, don't he? Well, maybe you'll find another one somewhere. Anyway, I sure like to hear him play in this town. A couple of the boys in particular, I guess. Yeah, they liked it just fine. Say, Mother, want to see your small fry eat a better breakfast than ever? Well, may I suggest that you dish them up some sugar crinkles to start with? Sugar crinkles, you know, make breakfast more fun than a circus. Sugar crinkles is the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. It's high time to forget the sugar-coated cereals that seem too sweet to you and those others that don't seem sweet enough to the kids. Just pour out crisp golden sugar crinkles and see how just right sweet a sugar-coated cereal can be. Just right sweet. Be sure to get several packages of sugar crinkles, because they're great for snacks. Kids love them that way. Kids love them anyway. Try sugar crinkles, and you'll love them too. Remember, new sugar crinkles is the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Vic Perrin, John Daner, Lawrence Dobkin, and Harry Bartell. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Special guitar effects by Al Hendrickson. 
Ken Peters speaking. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. I love the characterizations on Gunsmoke, but most importantly, the music made the show. It really did. And William Conrad as Matt Dillon? No better. December 26th, 1953, Gunsmoke on Classic Radio Theater. What does it mean to be an American? Just what are our American values? Working hard to succeed. Loving God, country, and family. Being honest, strong, and compassionate. Supporting our Constitution and recognizing that we are blessed to be living in America, the greatest country in the world. Our Bill of Rights protects us, our freedoms of worship, speech, and privacy, our right to own firearms, our right to trial by jury. Our right to be free, to live our own lives without some bureaucrat telling us what to do. Most countries don't have these rights. Want to know more? It's all there in the book. Get your own free book, the U.S. Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Then read it again, and this time share it with your friends. Our great Constitution is the basis of all of our freedoms, our inalienable rights. Get your own copy at freeusbook.com. Brought to you by the American Media Council. Well, now on Classic Radio Theater, we start a brand new Yours Truly Johnny Dollar story. This one entitled The Forbes Matter. Embezzlement, as it was originally broadcast December 26th, 1955. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Pauline Morris at Victor Turner's office, Continental Adjustment Bureau. Oh, hi, Pauline. How are you? Just fine, thank you. Uh, Johnny, Mr. Turner asked me to get in touch with you and find out what you're working on at the moment. Why, nothing. I was thinking of going to New York for a couple of days. Well, good. Would you be interested in handling a case for us while you're there? Oh, Pauline, I'm going to New York on a vacation. Well, this shouldn't take too much time. And, Johnny, it's really one of our most important accounts. Well, how much commission can I figure on? Do you want the truth? Sure. Practically none. Oh, fine. Why does Turner foist these things on me? Oh, I guess it's my fault. I told him I thought you might do it as a favor to us. For Mr. Turner or Continental Adjustment Bureau? No. For you? Okay, what is it? Well, Wait, uh, better still, why don't you tell me about it over dinner? Say, at the Crystal Room? Oh, I'd love that. I've been wanting to go there for months. Hey, you know something? I've been waiting for an excuse to take you there for years. Eight o'clock, Pauline? Eight o'clock. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Adjustment Bureau, 418 Elizabeth Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Forbes matter. It started quite pleasantly. Johnny, let's go back to the table and eat. I'm tired of dancing. Yeah, but once you sit down, you'll start talking business again. Well, of course I will. I do have a job to keep. Okay, okay. Frustrating girl. (laughs) Besides, the sooner you clear up this case, the longer you'll have for a vacation in New York. I said okay. There you are. Sit down. Thank you. All right, Miss Morris. Let's have the bad news. Well, the insurance company is Delaware Eastern Liability, New York office. Yes, ma'am. Their client who filed the complaint is a large dress manufacturing company, uh, Century Styles Incorporated. Yes, ma'am. Oh, and if you can manage to pick up one of their latest creations in my size while you're there, I love you forever. Yes, ma'am. Now, let's dance. No, no, wait. The auditors found a deficit in their books, $4,285. Well, naturally, the head of the company wants a settlement. Yes, ma'am. Now, let's... And, Johnny, your biggest problem will be Mr. Elliot. Mr. Robert Elliot, who I understand is something of a personality problem. He can't be any more of a problem than I'm having with you. Now, let's dance. Expense account item two, $28.63. Train fare and incidentals getting from Hartford to Manhattan. 
With me, I took all the necessary information concerning the indemnity claim of Century Styles with Delaware Eastern Liability and Trust. I arrived at Grand Central at 2.05 and was checked in at the New Western by 2.30. Air brisk, sky clear, weather cold. Expense account item three, 10 cents, phone call. To Robert P. Elliott, Century Styles Incorporated. Mr. Elliott said he would be happy to see me, so I went right over and found a four-story building that housed two floors of factory and two floors of offices. The factory was the usual crowded, noisy collection of machinery and people. The general offices overstuffed and overheated and overcrowded. Girls, girls, you must get ready. Come on, girls. Now, everybody... What the Sam Hill? Jenny, you'll just have to reduce. How can we fit you when the pins keep popping out? Uh, pardon me. Uh, I'm looking for Mr. Elliot. You are? True. Well, I'm Robert Elliot. Uh, oh, you must be Mr. Dollar. That's right. Stand by, Jenny, sweet. Please, these pins. We all suffer for our art child. Now, bear up. I'll deliver you soon. This way, Mr. Dollar, to a quiet corner. Mr. Elliot was small and wiry, wearing white warachis, green slacks, a corduroy jacket, and a flower print shirt of no identifiable color. As I followed him across the large and elegant showroom floor, I couldn't help stealing glances at the merchandise, animate and inanimate. Everything I saw was strictly high class. A group of goddesses. Mr. Elliot led me through a pair of swinging doors into an office with a carpet so thick I couldn't see my shoe tops. A desk in Russian gray sprawled in one corner. My office, Mr. Dollar. Mm Mm-hmm. I can't tell you how grateful I am that you're here, that the insurance company heeded my call. Well, I hope we can help you straighten this matter out. Well, it's scandalous. It's truly scandalous. $5,000. Really? Uh, the complaint said 4285 Mr. Elliot. Well, that's almost 5000 Besides, I like to deal in round figures. Brett Narnby to my auditors, and they said that you are the very important investigator in insurance circles. Well, I'm flattered. Did they happen to leave a copy of their findings? Yes, they did. They most certainly did. But before I give it to you, I must explain how awful this situation is. Now, please do. Well, you've no doubt heard of Patricia's things. No, no, I don't think... Yeah. Patsy's things? Why, of course... Oh, you're just joking. I am Patsy's things. In fact, I made Patsy's things. It's our highest price line, you know, evening dresses. Oh, you don't say. I definitely do. Oh, the nights of thankless work that go into creating just one gown. One supreme gown for the season. Oh, I'm sure. I'll tell you, Mr. Dollar, it's... Well, it's a thankless task in one respect. It... But that's a different story. What I'm trying to say is that this loss is devastating me. I mean it. I must. I simply must have an adjustment immediately. Well, the insurance company sympathizes with you, Mr. Elliott. We'll try to adjudicate it as quickly as possible. Oh, that's comforting. That's very comforting. Rob Elliott here. In my opinion, hats are just not important this year. Yes? No, no. No, 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 no. Positively no. No advance layouts on the new line. Not until later. No, not tomorrow. No, I can't. I simply cannot. Oh. Anything wrong? Well, that's what I mean. That's what I'm trying to explain. This matter simply must be handled with all dispatch, Mr. Dollar. You see, my firm operates on a... On a... Shoestring? Well, <laughs> spider's hair would be more apt. $5,000. Mr. Dollar, that comparatively small loss is stopping me from showing my new line of patsy's... The evening dresses. Yes, yes. I must show them before month's end or I'll lose my entire opportunity for profit. So, you see, I must have compensation for the loss. I think I get the picture, Mr. Elliot. Ah, uh, there. That, 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 that was the newspaper calling, and it's terrible. They all want advanced viewings of my new line, and I simply can't afford to. I, I can't afford to pay my help to produce the models. Mr. Dollar, for three agonizing months I worked. Frantically, I drew, I cut, I stitched. And not one warp over for my creation will be exhibited, can be exhibited, unless this matter is settled. Then suppose we get down to business. Well, the business is that some ruthless brigand pussyfooted off with my company's money. Well, do you have any idea? I don't. I don't have... No, no, no. Not so much as a footprint or a strand of hair. And, Mr. Dollar, if you don't find out who it was and return my money, I'll be cremated. Professionally cremated, that is. Why, I might even have to join the Foreign Legion. Well, don't worry, Mr. Elliot. If your loss is verified, and apparently a reputable auditing firm has already done that, I can assure you that the insurance company will reimburse that loss in the time it takes to get a check made out and in the mail. Oh, good. I'll be forever grateful. Well, while you're in this mood, would you mind me having a little closer rundown on what happened? Well, the auditors simply uncovered a shortage, that's all. I know that much, Mr. Elliott. May I see their report? Yes, of course. There. Isn't that binder an atrocious green? <laughs> well, if you say so. I'd like to keep this, Mr. Elliott, to verify my report. Of course, Mr. Dollar, anything, anything at all. Just save me. 
I left Mr. Elliott in a fainting condition, went back to my hotel, and studied the auditor's report. The obvious conclusion after an hour's reading was that the funds had been embezzled by someone in the bookkeeping department. A series of crude erasures and bad fumblings indicated that whoever had done it had been something less than expert. In fact, he or she had been almost idiotic. The next morning, I confirmed my own findings with Mr. Brett at the auditor's office. We uncovered the loss two days ago and advised Mr. Elliott to contact his insurance company first. Sure. Dollar, any reservations on your part? No, no, Elliot's got a legitimate loss here. I'm sending in my report today. He should be compensated in another two days. And he'll be relieved to know about that. <laughs> I know, I met him. Well, what's your next step? Well, we'll pay off Elliot so he won't have heart failure. But of course, we'll try to make recovery. I noticed the losses were in book series F6 through G10. Yes. Did you talk to personnel over there at his place? Mm Mm-hmm. A fellow by the name of Forbes handled that series for them. Uh In the accounting office, of course. Oh, yes. Been with Sensory Styles for five years. Where is he now? He's still there. Huh? Mm Mm-hmm. I thought it was kind of funny, too. A fellow pulling a crude job like this and not trying to run out. No, he's still working for them. Mm. Maybe he isn't the one at that. Forbes was in charge of those books. I don't see how it could possibly be anyone else. No, neither do I, Mr. Brett. May I use your phone? Oh, sure. Help yourself. I noticed all the money was stolen in the last four weeks. Yes. You'd think he'd at least have strung it out. Greedy, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. Hello. District Attorney's office, please. My name's Dollar. I want to talk to someone about a warrant. Embezzling funds, grand theft. Oh, hold it, please. Forbes. What's his full name? Uh, Sheldon Thomas Forbes. Thanks. Sheldon Thomas Forbes, bookkeeper at Century Styles Incorporated. Hmm? Good, I'm on my way. Expense account item four. Three dollars. Cab fare to the offices of John L. Gregory, deputy district attorney. I explained the situation to Mr. Gregory and furnished him with the auditor's report. An hour later, I was back at Century Styles with our friend, Mr. Elliott. Well, if it has to be, it has to be. There he is. Forbes? Hmm. Their desk. Sheldon Thomas Forbes was a tall, dark-complexioned man in his early 30s. His hair was black, straight, and closely cropped. His features regular, not good, not bad. The kind of man you see every day on the street. Somehow, the kind of man I hadn't expected would swipe $5,000. Oh, Mr. Forbes? Yes? This gentleman would like to see you. I feel like Brutus. Oh, why don't you run along, Mr. Elliott? I'll handle it from here. Oh, thank you. Hello? Sheldon Forbes? Yes. My name's Dollar, Continental Adjustment Bureau. We represent Delaware Mutual Liability. They cover this firm for losses by theft and fire. Uh Uh-huh. Two days ago, the auditing firm of Brett and Iron Beach located a loss of almost $5,000 here. Naturally, the matter came to our attention. I'd like to talk to you about it. Why me? There's every indication that the loss has occurred in the particular accounts you've been handling. Uh Uh-huh. You do handle books F6 through G10? Yes. Will you step over here a minute, please? Sure. Would you look at this, please? Your figures? Yes. Your handwriting? Uh huh. Your entries and your initials? Yes. Well? What do you have to say? Nothing. Look, you know why I'm talking to you, why I came to you first. Yes. Still nothing to say? Nothing. Well, aren't you being a little silly? Why? I stole the money. You've proved it. What am I supposed to say? You admit it. How can I deny it? Okay, we've got that much covered. Well, look, my company's interested in recovery of $4,285. Do you understand? I think so. Oh, now, Forbes, come to your senses. What do you want to do? Go to jail, or do you want to give the money back? (laughs) Oh, that's funny. Well, no, I don't think it's funny. I doubt if you will. I've got 16 cents in my pocket. Will that help? Where's the money? I haven't got it, Mr. Dollar. You'll have to take me to jail. Shall we go? Okay. Bill 
there'll be another intriguing episode of the Forbes matter tomorrow. What makes a man steal? Everybody's tried to answer that question at one time or another. Tomorrow I'll take a crack at it. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Seems like he's bound and determined just to go to jail and not say anything. December 26th, 1955, yours truly, Johnny Dollar on Classic Radio Theater. Wonder where the money is. I know Johnny, he'll find out. If you would like to find out how to get a collection of uh, yours truly, Johnny Dollar, contact Ted over at radiomemories.com. He has them in the finest quality that you will find, along with great classic radio theater programs available on cassette, CD, or flash drive for your computer, radiomemories.com. Please thank this radio station and support their advertisers. It is their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with you each and every time we come around. Uh, Contact them and uh, thank them, please. We thank them. We always do. Uh, If you would like to contact me, I'm more than happy to hear from you. Love to hear from you. Classicradio.stream is my webpage. Classicradio.stream. You can contact me there. You can learn more about building a classic radio collection of your own. Or you can uh, you can also hear our shows on demand. If you miss a day on this station, you don't have to miss a show. You can hear them on my webpage. You can hear them through the iHeartRadio app or Spotify, Spreaker, TuneIn. Just search for USA classic radio theater have a great day won't you please i'm wyatt cox tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial classic radio theater on your favorite radio station